Hi everyone, welcome to today's BIC streams. I'm your moderator for the day, Pavan Srinath. It's my absolute pleasure and privilege to be um, moderating this uh, important panel. Uh, we are having this discussion today about a full year since uh, we as a country took widespread action against the COVID-19 pandemic. There was a build up to this and we all remember the lockdown and the one year anniversary of the first uh, nationwide COVID-19 lockdown uh, is around the corner. And this is an important point, I think, for us to pause and also reflect on what are the kind of public health challenges that we are facing in the country and also what we might face in the future. And to also understand how we are, where we are, to understand India's public health journey, perhaps from the AIDS pandemic from before that, all the way to now COVID-19 and the future that awaits us. Um, so I will just make one or two very brief introductory remarks, and then we have our esteemed panelists who will be speaking for about 10 minutes each, and at the end of it, we will have um, a, a time for a discussion. Uh, uh, Ms. Gunani has an international conference to attend at 6.30, so we will be uh, uh, starting with her, and uh, we'll also take some time at the end of her uh, remarks to uh, address some questions. If, if any of you have questions, we'll uh, take them there. And at about 6.30, we, we shall continue with the rest of the panelists. Uh, so welcome. Um, we have many, many challenges in public health in India right now. And one of the challenges is also how there is a lot of confusion amongst uh, many of us in what is public health, what is government provided healthcare, and how public health ought to be about a lot more than just government hospitals or uh, public services at large. There are many public goods involved, and um, there is a role in prevention, there's role in vaccines, there's role in, in clean air and clean water. Public health is something that encompasses everything. And it's something that we have to confront as a society and figure out what roles we want the state and the government to play, what roles we want the private sector to play, and what roles we as individual citizens and members of society ought to be playing in order to promote public health in the country. So uh, today's panel, so you have you would have seen breathless coverage of the COVID-19 pandemic. What has the government response been? What have the unaddressed challenges been? You've seen coverage of that for the last year and, and more. So we will not be spending time today on diagnosing and re-diagnosing what's happening by the hour and by the day. Instead, we will actually take a step back to get a bit of a history and context and focus, but the, perhaps the big inflection points in India's public health systems, what are the strengths that we have today and what are remaining challenges that we ought to confront, and what are the most impactful steps we can take in 2021 and beyond to strengthen public health. So I'll not waste any more of your time. Uh, we have the complete uh, full bios of all our guests in the chat box. And I request all of you to uh, key in your questions at any point uh, in the Q&A section. And we'll be taking them up at the earliest uh, time possible. Uh, with that, I would request Ms. Vandana Gurnani, uh, Additional Secretary and Mission Director of India's National Health Mission to start us off. Uh, thank you uh, so much, uh, Pawan. And uh, I'd first at the outset like to uh, thank uh, Prasad Rao sir for organizing this and uh, also for being you, I mean, sir and, and others being patient with constant changes in this uh, scheduling of this uh, program uh, on account of our preoccupation with uh, the COVID related work and especially the vaccine drive. Uh, and if I look back, I think my public health journey also began with HIV AIDS. So I am absolutely fortunate and humble to be part of this discourse today, which is so, uh, you know, ideally labeled as the public health journey from AIDS to the COVID pandemic. Uh, my public health journey also began in 2003 when Prasad Rao sir was DG NACO and I was in the state of uh, Karnataka as the project director of the AIDS Prevention Society. So for me also personally, it's been a very, very long uh, journey in public health, close to now 12, 13 years uh, of this journey, both at the state or the provincial level and also at the uh, national level. 
so in terms of <clears throat> what you were mentioning right in the beginning that you know what do we mean by public health and uh, you know what should be the roles of government should be the role of private sector uh, and should be the role of the citizens so i think for us in government we uh, derive our inspiration from what we call the national health policy of 2017 which clearly uh, lays down uh, you know what we mean by uh, universal health coverage so i think for us now the goal is to move towards universal health coverage in all respects or what we call uh, health for all given that as you rightly said that a lot of public goods are involved external externalities are involved information asymmetries involved so keeping all that in uh, account uh, we are uh, we have set a very ambitious goal for ourselves to move towards uh, what we call universal health and i think uh, in this regard i just like to take a, a step back and what you were alluding to in terms of the covid pandemic because this last year has been a huge learning for us uh, in terms of uh, how a public health system responds uh what it doesn't respond what were the challenges what were the deficiencies what were the strengths uh that we were able to play to so i think there has been a huge learning for all of us uh in the last uh, one year through this uh covid pandemic uh, which is going to give us lessons uh not only now but for the future in terms of how we reengineer our systems and how we uh, strengthen ourselves to be able to respond to any such future pandemics uh, and if i take a moment to reflect and i look back at uh, the last uh, year the first quarter and how you know this pandemic hit all of us and we have to admit that you know uh, neither the world nor we as a country were really ready for it in in that sense uh, and we all learned through the pandemic uh, together the world learned the countries learned even the high income countries were struggling with uh, even basic things like infrastructure to be able to provide treatment and care to those getting infected uh, so that was it has been a huge learning for both us in the country as well as for i think the world uh, as a whole and this learning has been not only in terms of how we manage and respond to pandemics but also how we keep our other non pandemic or non covid related essential health services going uh, because a public health system has to be ready for both not just managing the pandemic but also managing the uh, regular routine uh, services which are so very critical to our uh, citizens and to our uh, people and i think that is where we have had a huge Uh, learning through this uh, process and i think i just like to reflect for some time on how the entire system uh, responded so it was not just from the field level uh, to you know where the front line workers and the asha the 1 million plus uh, but right up to the specialist uh, doctors at the tertiary level institutions from the outreach systems to the uh, tertiary systems to the procurement supply systems reorganization of the delivery to be able to deliver care close to people at their homes uh, governance and administrative changes that we had to make in terms of responding to it so i think a huge amount of work happened and we actually characterize this response as what we call a whole of government response and i think from a government of india perspective and i think same holds true for the states it was a response which didn't see only a health ministry work on it alone every sector aligned uh, with the health ministry and this was done in an institutional manner by setting up a group of ministers which brought in whether it was the civil aviation ministry whether it was the scientific ministries who had to concentrate on the research and development uh, <clears throat> whether it was uh, the ministries in charge of industry and production so that we could become self reliant in terms of the commodities that were uh, really needed to respond to the pandemic so i think this whole of government approach bringing in everyone together was critical in ensuring that you know we work together and i think even in the normal course if we can work like this the health sector can really get truly uh, transformed so what we did in the pandemic as an emergency response uh, you know really helped us uh, move forward uh, we set up what we call an emergency control room or what we call a war room right here in the ministry it is still functional uh, we had uh, partners from the private sector come in and support so we had people come in and offer services pro bono uh, the it sector came forward our Uh, mighty uh, the ministry came forward to offer us services that we will work alongside with you uh, to run this emergency control and command uh, center a similar center was set up in bengaluru also in the uh, city corporation so that was uh, another big thing that happened we had something like 11 empowered groups which were working uh, looking at every aspect of management of the pandemic so whether it was the emergency management plan uh, the testing the uh, the, the logistics uh, 
part coordinating with the private sector uh, coordinating with export and import so all these were you know set up at the high level and i think if we look back looking at the way we organized ourselves we've done pretty well uh, in terms of uh, making sure that from no testing labs to having close to 2500 labs now in the country from uh, literally no facilities for uh, isolation beds to now 15 lakh isolation beds from very few icu beds to 80000 icu beds aligned from very few ventilator manufacturers in the country to many manufacturers from no ppes and no masks in the country to now becoming a net exporter of these items uh, to the world uh, from supplying you know hcq and other drugs to the world i think it's been a long and successful story for india and i think which is now being repeated when it comes to the vaccine story also where we have uh, you know been able to support the world too the other thing i just wanted to mention was i think in any such response or in a public health system it can't move without adequate funding so i think this is where uh, again uh, we were fairly nimble footed and were able to mobilize the required resources both from finance ministry uh, using the national and the state disaster resource funds giving more flexibility to the districts to utilize the uh, emergency response fund so this was aligned fairly quickly in a very short time uh, and while following all the government procedures and norms so this was another huge thing human resources additions uh, use of the technology platforms the virtual training platform what we call the igod or the integrated uh, uh government online training platform to train all our health workers uh telemedicine and use of technology uh the covid-19 portal that we got in so i think there have, there was there was a huge amount of learning that we saw through the pandemic and i think going forward as we uh, think ahead uh these learnings will help us to even further strengthen our uh, public health systems going uh, forward and i think uh what we have uh, from within the ministry what we are doing now is and some of you must have seen the budget announcement we are we have prepared a plan in terms of pandemic preparedness for, for the healthcare uh, uh healthcare systems and this spans out not just the clinical services but all the public health functions from uh the entire surveillance systems that we need from protecting our borders and having strong uh you know points of entry systems at the airports at the land ports so we have a pm atmanirbhar swasth bharat yojana which was announced in the budget and uh, it's going to take care of having more critical care beds right up to every district having critical care management beds oxygen support systems uh, they were hugely scaled up but we want to scale them up further to be prepared for not only pandemics but these are things we also need uh, during the routine times to be able to manage the changes in disease burden that uh, india is uh, going through a uh, very robust surveillance systems through uh metropolitan health labs uh, urban areas uh, are going to be a big focus so many of you would have heard about uh, the health and wellness centers or our approach to comprehensive primary health care these are now going to be set up also in the urban areas in a major way because what the pandemic also taught us was that urban areas also need strong public health investments apart from the private sector being there because there are core things which have to be done by the government and therefore those investments are coming in <coughs> so i think what the pandemic also taught us and i have to admit this initial part there was a withdrawal of the private sector and i think we have to admit to that and we did witness right in the beginning especially when there were no pps etc uh, the private sector almost shut down but gradually with uh, you know more and more uh, uh, protective equipment being available with uh, more and more uh, uh, science and evidence on how we can manage pandemic uh, coming up Uh, the private sector also opened up but for us in government it was a learning that uh, the public health systems have to be stronger they have to also uh, be available especially even in the urban areas we can't just leave it to the private sector alone and there are core functions like uh, you know uh, the surveillance functions etc which have to be done by government and therefore we need robust systems another important thing going forward in our public health systems is the use of technology and therefore telemedicine is a big thing that we are focusing on uh, even now in the uh, as part of e sanjeevani and the direct contact between the patients and uh, the doctors uh, through telemedicine through call centers i think that's been a paradigm shift uh, that we are seeing uh, that you don't have to necessarily visit a facility all the time there are a host of technology solutions which are available 
which can be uh, utilized uh, wherein people can get care from the comfort of their homes itself and i think <clears throat> that's a big thing going forward and i think that's going to be uh, the new normal as we are seeing in workspaces how uh, virtual meetings have transformed uh, the way we work even for health i think uh, telemedicine is going to be a big step uh, moving forward so i think these are our some of the summary of you know the learnings that we have and how we see the uh, public health systems uh, going forward i've tried to summarize this uh, very quickly being mindful of the time and uh, uh, being able to manage and get any questions that uh, would be there from the audience i thought i should just give a brief overview of uh, what we have done and what we are moving forward with uh, an important element is the covid vaccine which i haven't touched upon because i think that's the most uh, hotly uh, covered topic in the media and i'm sure the group here is aware of uh, what is happening so again that's a big success story for india not only for the way we are moving domestically but how we are supporting the world as far as vaccines are concerned and our per day immunization with the help of all the states and the uh, long investments in the health system which have happened over the year are showing our ability to even go up to 30 lakh immunizations per day and we are confident that this can be scaled up to even 50 lakh we have the cold chain capacity we have a robust it platform that is functioning there was some initial slowness but now it's been made very very flexible and citizen friendly and one is receiving very good feedback on this uh, it system also so i think uh, our learning has been when we all work together uh, all sectors join hands we we are able to Uh, manage the situation very well so this is from me uh, over to you uh, pavan uh, thank you so much uh, ms gurnani and uh, uh, dear attendees please share your questions i mean we'll see what we can address in the next 10 minutes or so uh, to perhaps start off with ms gurnani could you maybe expand on what we can expect from the new normal of indian public health systems uh, for example one technology change that i'm seeing is that a year ago uh, the access to say an rt pcr test you know which is the gold standard test to diagnose any virus for example uh, was not something that was common in india people would go for more you know um, uh, different tests to whether diagnose dengue or anything else but with the creation of all of this necessary infrastructure to fight this pandemic in you know in a war mode we have actually also created assets that can be useful for us uh beyond the pandemic right so maybe could you give us other examples of what you see as perhaps some game changing um systems technologies and uh, it, their prevalence in india which can define the new normal uh if you will so i think you very rightly pointed out about the testing capacities and i didn't dwell much on that but it was a story where the Uh, with the government and the science and the private sector work hand in hand to make sure that uh, that rapid scale up uh, happen on uh, on the availability of tests and even now many countries across the world you don't have the facility of a walk in test like we have in india no prescriptions needed you can get a testing done uh, anywhere so that's that's been a huge uh, uh, you know change that has uh, happened uh, i think uh, <clears throat> i'll again come back to uh, in terms of the the new normal uh, one big thing that has happened is the uh, use of technology in terms of access to care through telemedicine and i think that's something that is here to stay and i'm hoping that even the post pandemic when the pandemic is behind us though it's a one in 100 year phenomena this is something that is not only going to stay but it's going to get stronger and stronger from what one is also hearing from the industry in terms of the kind of uh, products that they are developing even for diagnostics Uh, not just for consultation but even for diagnostics the kind of uh, uh, technology that is being now developed uh, will certainly be adding to this uh, kind of uh, system where we don't have to necessarily uh, make a physical visit to a public uh, health uh, facility uh, i think the other thing in the new normal that <clears throat> we are going to uh, see for us in the health system is uh, one is the uh, you know use of it again for all kinds of capacity building Uh, so from the earlier days where we used to have so many uh, physical trainings i think what we have also seen that even in the covid-19 vaccine uh, you know the day on 1st march when it had to be launched uh, and the private sector had to be involved uh, we in the ministry were sitting here on a sunday 
and doing a training and capacity building of 7,000 private health facilities right here from Delhi, uh, sitting in environment, 7,000 facilities, private health facilities connected to us because we had to tell them what is the system, how much you must keep the vaccine in the cold chain, how you must manage adverse events, what are the kind of medicines uh, you must keep, how you must align your team to make sure that you're able to use the IT platform. We were able to do 7,000 people simultaneously uh, in the country on uh, the first day before, I mean, the one day before first uh, March uh, right here. So that was, I think for us, uh, I think use of uh, this technology has changed everything for us. and it was going to help us in all our capacity building initiatives, including the ones in government. Uh, the other thing I think has been the, the massive uh, communication that goes around uh, health and health behavior. Uh, and as you would have seen in COVID, uh, there was a, a huge emphasis on communication, uh, though one is still again seeing some bit of slackening in terms of COVID appropriate uh, behavior, but without that thrust on uh, communication, uh, I don't think uh, we can, uh, move on any uh, health seeking behavior or behavior change. So I think that's going to be the new normal for us also moving forward that uh, communication has to be across the board from all uh, levels and a big uh, thrust has to be on the on the communication. And the last thing, as I had mentioned earlier, I think urban health for us and a focus on urban areas, uh, the big towns and cities, as well as the smaller municipalities is going to be a, a big thing. And that's in that new normal, it can't happen without the engagement of the community, without the involvement of the RWAs. It can't be just a supply driven uh, kind of an initiative. It has to have uh, entire citizen centric and community involvement uh, because in rural areas, we have very good systems uh, uh, over the years of community engagement and involvement. Uh, but urban areas, these systems are weak. These systems are fragmented. Uh, so we would need to make sure that uh, this, the kind of community engagement we have in rural areas, we have to now have in the urban areas also. And this is where the role of uh, the resident welfare associations and the citizens also is going to be very important going forward. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. And thank you for saying that because I think uh, we can't stress hard enough that there's a difference between awareness and good hygiene habits and actual behavior change. For example, all of us who are attending this know that it's healthy to brush two times a day. But not all of us will necessarily be do the, uh, doing that, even though all of us are aware. So <clears throat> I think this importance of driving um, uh, information and awareness to actually change in behavior is something that all, all three components, government, private sector, and community have to work together. Uh, so thank you for saying that. I think uh, Giridhar Babu also has a question. Giridhar, why don't you go ahead? Uh, good evening, ma'am. At the outset, my uh, sincere congratulations to the entire team at the ministry for leading uh, the efforts against the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, something connected to the leadership, I have a question on the way pandemic preparedness is addressed all over the world. Uh, if you look at something like Global Health Security Index, India is ran moderately ranked, whereas UK and US are ranked one and two. But in terms of response, India's response was far superior compared to the developed countries. So when I look at this uh, and then say, okay, leadership is one of the elements, maybe innovation and collaboration, these were the elements which made India so successful. But you are the leader for this entire uh, program from the ministry. How do you view and how do you, uh, in the long term, uh, pandemic preparedness to be strengthened, uh, including these subjective elements which are not there in the objective indexes. Uh, I'm not sure whether I uh, uh, got uh, the question uh, too clearly, but I think you've raised a very important point that uh, despite uh, the global in the global health uh, index are ranking not being very high, and despite us knowing you know that we have a huge population and our uh, health systems are what they are, I think. Uh, it's good to hear from you. It's always good to hear from outside that uh, the uh, response and uh, the outcomes in India have been much, much better than uh, many other countries. And I keep saying touch wood uh, to that. And I hope we continue uh, to be like that. And I think uh, speaking about uh, leadership, since you have raised that issue, uh, I think uh, we had, uh, see the country has a very strong leader and uh, the entire response was driven and managed and overseen and reviewed 
uh, from the honorable prime minister's office and uh, even now i didn't i didn't mention that but the kind of uh, meetings that happened not just from there but with the states it was collaborative it was not centralized it was collaborative effort with all the states completely roped into that so these series of discussions between the uh, prime minister and the chief ministers uh, similarly between the cabinet secretary and the chief secretaries on almost i would say sometimes an alternate day basis uh, then within uh, from our ministry to uh, the state governments between the ministries so this kind of a collaborative effort uh has actually you know led to this response and this effort was also you know and let's not ignore what happened in the districts in each district the kind of response that uh, you know uh, the people uh, led and or led by our uh, you know deputy commissioners and the district magistrates in the districts uh, it's all uh, been part of you know this 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 story uh, so this kind of strong leadership this kind of collaboration this kind of uh, community engagement and involvement and innovations and Uh, i think use of uh, technology has has made this uh, kind of a response uh, possible and i think going forward also we are confident uh, that we would be able to manage both the pandemic and also this vaccination drive which will i think hopefully bring down uh, further the numbers that are recently going uh, showing a surge in, especially in some geographies <clears throat> thank you ma'am that's a great this thank you so much uh, i'm just cognizant of time i think we are at 628 um, so um, ms gurdani thank you so much for joining us and for uh, taking the time to talk to all of us and uh, we'll keep of course continuing to uh, learn what's happening and know how uh, we are getting out of the pandemic and into a better place thank you so much uh, for joining us uh, thank you pavan uh, it's been an honor to be part of this discourse thank you <clears throat> um thank you so much ms gunani uh, we'll continue with uh, uh, the rest of our panelists and sort of take all their initial remarks and then i'll open the floor again for questions uh, perhaps say a little before 7 uh, but in the meantime please keep your uh, questions coming in and we'll take them up as and when we can uh, perhaps uh, mr prasad rao uh, maybe you can start us off uh, you've been in uh, the government uh, working in the highest levels in the health ministry well before the time of the covid pandemic and uh, often it is very easy for us living in this pandemic world to think that everything around public health uh, starts and begins with the covid 19 pandemic but we didn't come here with eyes completely closed this was not the first ever such large public health challenge that we've undertaken and uh, we had to face the aids epidemic a while ago and it was a very different beast compared to what covid-19 has been uh, but you've been uh, seeing that through the course of your career and you've also written a very interesting new book on it so could you tell us about uh, what it was like to tackle pan- something like the aids pandemic and what perhaps might have been just lost from public imagination and memory today uh, if you could refresh our memory on that it would be wonderful thank you thank you srinath and um, thanks to bic uh, for organizing this uh, webinar on a very 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 topical issue and uh, yeah i think your observation tells everything that people of this generation i think probably think that yes i think covid is the first serious public health challenge that india has ever faced that's because we all forgot about um, what happened even 20 years back the public memory is so 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 short you see that is the problem but uh, for people like me who traveled this distance for the last 20 years and uh, i'm happy that two of the participants who are here both uh, ms gurnani and uh, dr choudhury have been my co travelers all this journey and in a way dr giridhar babu also has seen this of course from a different lens but uh, so at least i am in good company when i say i am not saying something from the top of my hat but in 90s when i joined naco i mean i found that the type of um, the type of support systems that were provided for covid response were not there because in the case of uh, covid the, the, if you compare covid and covid and uh, hiv the big difference is covid is like a tsunami it just came and swept everyone off their feet nobody can sort of deny that there is a huge big problem there 
because it, it, it devastated economies, it devastated families, its presence was so visible that people had to take notice of it, governments, people, everyone. But AIDS was not like that, at least in Asia. I mean, in South Africa and South Saharan Africa, it's a different um, ball game. But here, it crept in, you know, very quietly, very silently. That's why we always called it a silent tsunami. It was a tsunami, but it is a very silent tsunami. Just came in and nobody recognized. In 1997, when I joined NACO, we were reporting 90,000 um, cases every, I mean, every year to the parliament, saying that these are the reported cases we have. Whereas the international community, our own communities were crying hoarse, saying that, no, that's not correct. There's so many more people. People are dying on the streets. And then you are not taking notice of it. That's how we started. So initially, to come out of that big denial mode that the country was in, was itself is a big challenge. But we did it because two things. One is there was great leadership. We had a prime minister like Atal Bihari Vajpayee ji at the time, who was always accessible, always available, always very responsive. Second is we have been able to build in data systems and surveillance systems within the country, which captured the, the, the intensiveness of the epidemic, the intensive nature of the epidemic. Otherwise, people were not knowing. Nobody knew that Andhra Pradesh, Karnataka, and Maharashtra have almost equal amount of prevalence like, uh, like Tamil Nadu. Nobody knew. Only through the data, we could come to know. And that was disseminated to people. So that's how slowly we built it. And the communities, which were at the center of the epidemic at the time, what we call the key populations, the sex workers, and then the drug users, and the men who have sex with men, the transgenders, they are also sufferers even now. That's, that's one thing. When I see that happening, I feel a sense of deja vu. Yes, nothing has changed. Nothing has changed really when it comes to the, the, the outlook of the society towards the poor, poor and vulnerable populations. That is the unfortunate part. See, but the, the response started with those things. The involvement of communities was the real hallmark for the success of the program. And the funding was provided, leadership was there. We could decentralize the program to the state level and district level. And in a period of five years, we could see the change. We could see the change that 56% reduction in the number of new infections has happened because of consistently good performance by many of the state governments and the leadership given by government of India. So that's, that, is the, that is the story. But having said that, what happened after that, again, is the same good old story that we find that when you are halfway down, you find that yeah, everything is fine now. We have achieved, we have already there. And in 2015, when all the countries in the world came to New York and signed a declaration saying that we are going to end AIDS, TB and malaria by 2030, we thought, yes, we are there. But the very next year, when the targets were fixed for 2020, in terms of prevention, in terms of uh, coverage of treatment, in terms of elimination of mother-to-child transmission, we found that we are nowhere. And the very communities who need to be at the center of the response were not even mentioned in the political declaration in 2016. And that is when the slide has started. So I was all the time warning in my own way. I was not in the government system. I was in the UN. I was the special envoy of the Secretary General, saying that this is a big mistake we are doing. By ignoring the importance, the central role of the communities, you are actually going down the slide. That is exactly happened. In 2020, we have this... Uh, terrible scenario of a collective failure of most of the countries in achieving any of those uh, milestones, which were set up for as an intermediate uh, level targets before you, you move to 2030 to end, end AIDS, TB or malaria or whatever. So the, now that means we are, I won't say we are back to square one, but we are getting stuck on the response. So that is the unfortunate part in, in, uh, in, 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 in HIV response. And I see that if we don't learn those lessons, and if we don't invest in public health, and in, we don't invest in communities in their participation, we will be committing the same mistake in the case of COVID. You asked Mrs. Gurnani that, um, what is the new normal? The new normal is still not very well understood, I would say. Because the new normal is not just carrying on and putting more money into wellness centers and, uh, and Ayushman Bharat. It needs a lot more thinking, a lot more involvement of the people, especially the communities, the poor and vulnerable communities in the programs. This is where I find the big difference between COVID-19 and HIV. 
HIV has been a classic example. It's, it's, a, it's an example for the world, what India has done at the time. The way the communities have been involved in the program, not just as, uh, as beneficiaries, but as partners. And the social contracting system that India introduced at the time has been a model for the entire world later on. But you find when it comes to COVID-19, where are the communities? They are nowhere. I mean, that is a very serious lacuna, I would say, in the COVID-19 response. Because everything is government and all the other government ministries were there, departments were there, state governments were there, right up to Anganwadi workers, everyone, but they're all government functionaries. And But where are the communities? But doesn't mean that communities have not done any work. They have done tremendous work, but without any recognition. And in fact, we have one person here, Dr. Angela Choudhury, who is a member of that uh, COVID, uh, COVID Action Collaborative, which is one of the biggest conglomerate of uh, NGOs working in COVID-19. But where are they in terms of visibility with the governments? People know about them, but what about governments? So that is, that is the real issue, I would say, that the big difference between the AIDS and COVID. That means we have learned certain lessons, but we have not learned all the lessons. And the new normal, if it doesn't take care of those issues, those characteristics of the COVID, uh, AIDS response, I think we are missing the, missing the message somewhere. I will stop now. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, uh, I'm really glad for your remarks and I actually have several follow-up questions myself, uh, but I would request uh, Dr. Uh, Angela Chaudhary to perhaps go next and uh, speak about other aspects of uh, our panel today that, that we are thinking about. Uh, so Dr. Chaudhary, how do you see uh, in India's public health systems, uh, what do you see the private sector's role to be? And what have you seen as new modes of private and also the community uh, functioning that we have seen over the last year? Uh, because we know that, for example, uh, at least 4.7% of our GDP, if not more, uh, is spent on healthcare, health and healthcare as a society. Uh, and this is what is capturable in terms of numbers. And in this, the government share is only about 1.3% uh, or so, or maybe 1.5%. And uh, so basically that means that the rest of it uh, is still being, being paid a lot of the times out of pocket by people and also going to the private sector, going to very different places. So this is it's not like uh, the private sector has not been there before they've been an integral part of especially higher healthcare and tertiary services delivery in the country uh, but how do you see this uh, them playing a better role in the in managing and building the overall health systems in india hi pavan um, uh, i'm really honored to be part of this panel um, i'll just take a short twist to the question that you asked uh, because uh, dr rao uh, who's my co traveler um, uh, opened a very important point about vulnerable communities. And the people who are dying and the most affected um, are actually the vulnerable communities. We've seen more deaths due to starvation than COVID. We've seen more uh, deaths due to very preventable uh, you know, diseases of infants and mothers than COVID. Just putting that in a very larger public health perspective here. Um, and therefore, just having a systems uh, where we, we call people, just having a health systems a lens towards COVID doesn't work. And HIV has been very unparalleled. Uh, the HIV response has been very unparalleled. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, the lessons that we can take out of HIV, which have not yet necessarily trickled to COVID for a very effective COVID response. So what did we see in the COVID response? Uh, people said, come and test if you have symptoms, um, we've been told to wear masks, keep distance, etc. But those are earning daily wages. How often do you see them actually keep, is it even possible for them to wash their hands with soap and water? Is it possible for them to carry out their daily duties? Maybe to some extent with masks, but really look at the majority of our population. Is it even possible to have distance? Our, our population density doesn't even allow for that. And for most of them, it is a daily wage. It's a daily earning, the food on the table. And therefore it's really a, a, like a, a rich person's disease. If you, uh, you know, we all have the luxury and we are privileged to work from home and behind a computer, but uh, not 90% of our population and certainly not to those who are 
um, uh, marginalized and don't have access to services. Um, what has happened in the HIV response is there was a very strong community-centered response, community participated. They were not in, in, in very uh, common layman person. They were not patients or they were not beneficiaries. They participated in their health. They were part of demand generation. They were part of the awareness themselves. They were peer counselors. They changed behaviors of their own friends, families, or people like them. And these were not just, uh, unlike COVID, they're not just poor people or people with disabilities and disease, um, people who are far away from health systems, but they're also people with tremendous complicated lives, like women in sex work, like men who have sex with men and trans people, like people who inject drugs. Now, the HIV response was not just a whole of the government approach, which was mentioned earlier, which was very required for the COVID response, but it was actually a whole of the society approach. And everyone had a role to play to get the most vulnerable protected in the HIV response. Now for COVID, right? If you're asking people to go somewhere and get tested, it means someone has to give up their daily wage. Someone has, has to probably give up child care. Someone has to give up many, many things to be able to just spend those two or three hours to get tested and many more hours to get the results. And they wouldn't know what to do if they were positive. They're scared of losing their livelihood. Now, this is because the community has not been in the center or has not been engaged very strongly to say, hey, how do we do this together? Because the solutions lie with them. The solution does not lie with the doctors or the governments because we don't leave, live those lives. We, are, we don't live in the slums. We don't have daily wage, uh, daily earning issues. We are not in places where uh, we are beaten by our spouses every day. We are in a very different paradigm of life. Therefore, if the COVID response was to be very effective, for example, we've talked about community-based testing. How does one champion uh, uh, testing and screening and saying, hey, it's not all bad. There are community ways in which we can actually take care of you. Uh, there are social protection schemes. Yes, you, you have COVID uh, and therefore you need to quarantine. But here are some schemes that will take care of your daily wage. Here are some childcare schemes, for example, social, you know, social protection and entitlements. So this HIV response has really shown the way in which people living with HIV as well has participated in how the response, how they've adhered to treatment and how, how uh, the response actually showed a success. And as Dr. Rao said, the moment people's participation was taken out of the response, the indicators directly showed that there was a decline in the way that HIV uh, was being implemented. Similarly, in COVID, the, the only way we can move beyond this is not just vaccination and wear the mask, whatever, is, is to take the communities along. Communities who are marginalized, communities who, for whom all of these are impossible. Clean water, uh, freedom from violence, just going to the, have, having the trust that someone will give them empathetic, respectful, quality care if they go to the local PHC. All of those barriers will, will need to be you know, sort of uh, overcome with participation of uh, communities. So I hope I answered your uh, question, Baba. Uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, and um, I, I want to open the floor up to um, Dr. Giridhar Babu. Uh, perhaps could you give us a Bangalore uh, perspective or a Karnataka perspective, you know, looking from south up north rather than perhaps from Delhi outward. Do you see any different views on how we our public health systems have evolved and how they have coped and managed during the this insane stress test that has been put on our systems and our society at large over the last year? Thanks, Pawan, for having me, thanks to BIC, and I'm very happy to be among the esteemed uh, co-panelists here. Uh, Pavan, I would just uh, try to uh, reconfigure the question. I don't think uh, there is uh, a perspective which might be limited only to Bangalore or the South. Uh, we might have to uh, look at this probably from a, uh, a, a India point of view. And uh, I really like the word uh, what uh, uh, Prasad Rao sir used, uh, deja vu. But when a pandemic uh, uh, any uh, hitting any country, not just India, the word that I would uh, like to use is uh, you know uh, which is the opposite of it. 
which is jamai which means things should be familiar but it looks new sir said we have learned so much uh, and the public memory is probably short lived uh, he didn't say it in that terms but then uh, i would uh, go one step further and say after this covid 19 pandemic is over my biggest fear is that people would not worry about uh, another pandemic in future already you see that people don't want to wear mask and they don't want to follow covid 19 appropriate behavior the reason is that uh, i always compare epidemiologists to uh, and all the public health people put together to uh, uh, people who are uh, engaged in uh, extinguishing uh, fire so the moment there is fire people uh, want their health uh, they would say okay we will give all the uh, better investments for you know fire department will strengthen them and all that once the fire is extinguished nobody worries about them uh, i i hope it changes i am an optimist eternal optimist i do hope that things will change and this is the reason why uh, what vandana ma'am explained so very well all of government approach is required for strengthening public health uh, health department as such has been named i would say it's a misnomer because most of the times what health department does is take care of the illness and sometimes prevents the illness whereas the determinants of health are beyond the department of health it's in food and civil supplies it's in agriculture department it's in the road safety uh, department so every department is needed to have uh, healthy uh, societies having said that the critical element going forward uh, for any state is the way we look at uh, the pandemic preparedness as just a symptom of how well uh, we are oriented for uh, health as a important domain uh, at an individual level people would want to save for children's education or marriage or house but how many people at the individual level would think of health as an investment so then let's go at the society level uh, are we building uh, roads safe enough to walk or there enough parks uh, the fine kind of food uh, and the diet practices that we have are they healthy if these are not paid attention and the way we consume food uh, is also reflected in the way the pandemics are generated so more than 80% of them are going to be zoonotic diseases in the future so what we do how we live has a major impact on the future pandemics and the future uh, you know of health as uh, in the country or anywhere so given that is the orientation are we reorienting our health approach at the state level or at the national level i mean why only state and national at an individual level or family level are we reorienting ourselves i feel this is where we find again everything is new we just want to get back to our lives start working with whatever we were doing earlier because we feel all this is restriction all this is is unnecessary i think this is where uh, the role of uh, uh, people coming together organizations coming together is very important uh, again another point which vandana ma'am mentioned so well uh, i uh, give a uh, lot of credit to the indian management of covid 19 because when we knew that it's like you lose first match in the cricket series but we did not lose a match but we had this feeling that okay things are going to be bad because we are not prepared well how are we going to manage this and then you see the response which is definitely much better than compared to the uh, some of the developed countries but there are lessons learned here uh, one of the things ma'am said was online platforms for training and the way the coordination was between center and the states now why these shouldn't continue for whole of health approach the whole of government approach should be necessary for addressing all the determinants of health and thereby we can sustain our partnership with the communities with the other stakeholders and then continue towards uh, progress my worry uh, pawan is we are very proud of demographic dividend in this country but as of now uh, non communicable diseases are uh, hitting the younger population much earlier a decade earlier two decades earlier depending on which disease we look at uh, we are going to face huge problems uh, in the future uh, the united states spends 17% of their gdp on health 
and most of it is on diagnostics and the kind of uh, pharma and the insurance are we going in that direction that it's okay to have sicker societies but then we will keep spending up uh, the proportion of gdp on these curative services alone i'm not denying that they are important they are very important but if you do not address the feed up pipe of this illness uh, by addressing the determinants of health which i feel covid 19 has given i mean it's a wrong to say that covid 19 has given us an opportunity but it is true that we have explored this crisis and we have tried several innovations several collaborations i'm working with physicists mathematicians uh, at a scientific level and at the government level they are working with every agency to just focus on covid 19 now if you replace covid 19 with health as the central focus and address all the other determinants of health i think that is the way forward even our percentage of gdp on health should be counted towards doing those things how are we changing the determinants of health not simply for one element of this illness uh, or one vaccine or one drug uh, we should be looking at that uh, perspective uh, if we start looking at uh, prevention and health promotion from now on at every level individual society and state and national level i think that's the biggest lesson from uh, this entire thing so from hiv to covid 19 this lesson has been same next time let us not act as something new the last thing i would want to say is the role of data uh we look at some of the states which do not report well and we don't say anything about it and we look at other states uh which are reporting probably better which have test better and then we say okay these are high burden states this is something which we saw in polio earlier we saw in hiv and then now we are seeing in covid 19 also we need to have strong resilient data reporting systems throughout the country that's a non negotiable uh, service that is required because if we don't have that it actually disempowers people who already have several problems so a state that doesn't report well actually worsens the inequities for the poor who will not get the services who otherwise should get it so therefore if we make data as the uh, combining force for all the determinants of health and if we use whole of government approach uh, to uh, mark our progress ahead i think uh, we'll be in a good shape thanks thanks everyone for having Uh, thank you, Dr. Babu. Uh, I'm opening the floor up to questions from uh, the attendees, and uh, but I want to start with a question of mine to all three of you. Uh, one, do you think that uh, Indian public health system is perhaps you know better at playing T20s than Test matches? Are we good? You know, like. you know we want to organize the kumbh mela india knows how to do it where most states most societies in the world might struggle to organize something like a kumbh mela so in that sense are we good at doing mission mode rapid action take on a challenge that is immediate and try and solve it to the best of our ability but but do we fare badly when we need a stamina when it is a marathon and not a sprint and why are we more likely to falter before say successfully finishing a marathon this question one related question do you think in health we sometimes get caught up in either or uh, questions which are actually and questions right i mean like uh, dr babu mentioned non communicable diseases and how it's hitting uh, our population at a younger age uh, so you know sometimes i see news framed as you know ncds are now more important than communicable diseases and then covid 19 comes around right it's not like india has solved its communicable disease burden like say many countries in the west and only has to deal with the problem of non communicable non communicable disease and aging so do we get lost in these either or uh framings in our mind and do are we like generally better prepared to play our t20s better than our test matches uh any one of you can start us off uh, perhaps uh, mr rao yeah thank you uh, i think the, the first question is very relevant because um, whenever there is a disaster we always respond very well i know um, i started my career with the bangladesh uh, uh you know war of independence when i was in the districts i think india has done some exemplary work at the time but then it was about almost 50 years back but we are continuing in the same way so that means we are always back to our own regular way of working once that particular crisis is over but always we left something behind it's not that everything is forgotten 
I always try to compare what did we leave back uh, from AIDS to COVID. I two things come to my mind. One is the the data and information system. What Dr. Giridhar Babu mentioned. When uh, the AIDS pandemic struck us, we had zero data, zero data practically. The entire surveillance systems, sentinel surveillance, zero surveillance, behavioral surveillance, all these things came up only because of HIV AIDS. And we didn't abandon that. We continued with that. We continued with that. And that really helped us in a lot in tracing the COVID pandemic. The Integrated Disease Surveillance Program, the IDSP, is one of the things that came actually into being because of HIV AIDS, because the necessity was felt at the time. And then the strengthening the data systems were very important. I don't think it's perfect, but I think at least that's something we, we kept. Second is the public health education and research. I mean, Dr. Babu is a member of the Indian Institute of Public Health. These institutes would not have come, but for that uh, warning signal we got because of AIDS. Today we have got something like 30 or 32 schools of public health in India compared to one or two which we used to have in 1999-2000. So the entire public health as an important area of knowledge, not for just medical doctors, but anybody who is interested in community work, who is interested in public health work, today it's open. Even a, even a master's degree holder can take an MPH and then join a public health program. So that, that is the big change that has come. So certain things definitely are there, but as you said rightly, many things we forget and we are always learning from uh, a, a new pandemic new lessons are learned, etc. Thank you. Dr. Babu, would you like to add to that? Or shall I flag another question? Yeah, I think um, uh, Sadra said answered it really comprehensively. I don't think I have anything to add. All right. Uh, we have a question here from uh, Mr. Varun Rangarajan. Um, what he is asking is that, do you think there's a concept like family caregiver, caregiver education? Family caregiver education can uh, make a big difference in India. Do you think there is value uh, if hospitals, government programs and society at large spends more time to you know, help our caregivers better? so that eventually health of society, health of the patients who the care is being given to can actually do a lot better. Uh, perhaps uh, uh, Dr. Chaudhary, you might want to answer this and then Dr. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I'm, 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 I'm laughing because it's, it's, it's such a good question and it's, it's, a, it's an obvious answer, right? I mean, if we empower ourselves and our families to take care, most of primary health care prevention uh, can happen at home. And that would reduce overcrowding uh, to the PHCs and even less uh, crowding to the secondary uh, tertiary hospitals. So uh, when we, when some of us, uh, and this has been decades ago, uh, were in public health school, the first point of care was the hospitals. Um, but, uh, and that was during the Alma Atta declaration. And since then, a couple of years ago, our standard declaration put family at the center bringing the power to the fam people and the family themselves. And therefore the first point of care, treatment, support uh, is definitely the family. In fact, uh, uh, Dr. Rao um, uh, uh, led from the front um, the work that PLHIV networks were doing, which is home-based care. care, caring at home, um, caring from, for the peers um, and, uh, and, and people being in charge of the treatment and care, so yes. Absolutely. One, one quick point there. You know, again, we are, we are talking about COVID uh, pandemic. One very important missing element in the entire COVID management is absence of counseling. You know, there has been hardly any counseling service in the COVID care hospitals. It's mostly the patient and the doctor, caregiver and then the patient. Whereas in case of HIV, we used to have this chain of counseling centers located within the hospitals. And the first point of contact for the patient is not the doctor, but the counselor. And the counselor is not only for the patient, but also for the doctor. So that's how the interface has been created. And that really worked very well in cutting down the stigma and discrimination in the case of HIV. But some of the other, it is totally absent in the case of COVID. So I want to ask all of you, this is a question from um, uh, Ms. Shruti Ayer. Um, when you were dealing uh, with the AIDS epidemic, uh, 
places which were hotspots for AIDS, they, they would also be other diseases that might be quite prevalent in that area, right? In fact, um, HIV patients will be far more susceptible to every type of infection. So at the cost of trying to tackle HIV, was there ever a, uh, a reduction in care provided to other chronic diseases? Because we have seen that with COVID-19, right? Uh, at the cost of trying to manage COVID-19, some of say, uh, you know, uh, drug resistant uh, uh, TB patients who need cutting edge drugs, you know, where even one day, two days, if they skip their drug regimen, you know, they can build resistance. Um, you know, you have a lot of discontinuation that has happened. Many HIV patients, their uh, medical regimens have been disrupted. So do you see any difference from before to now? Uh, because to get to a place where we can think about how can COVID-19 response inform us better to manage our chronic health service provision problems from malnutrition to TB to everything else, when COVID-19 crisis has directly impacted all of this, you know, it's a tough question to get to. Yeah, there, there is this criticism, even not only in India, elsewhere also, that COVID has, that AIDS has sucked out all the resources from health and then others have suffered. But that, that is not correct. That means you are actually not investing adequately in the entire health. But that being a priority was given more money, and more resources. That doesn't mean that others should not get. It is not the question of diversion of resources from one program to another. It is a question of putting more money into every programs. Basically, if India is spending 1% of the GDP, even after so many years of independence, the message is not to sort of divert 1% from one program to another, but to increase it 1% to 2 or 3%. That has to happen. So, but to answer your question, HIV, when it started, there were no antiretrovirals. And TB was the biggest um, co-infection. So we used to have this program called Management of Opportunistic Infections. And we started COVID care, the HIV care centers where not only HIV, but all the opportunistic infections like TB, candidiasis, all of them were treated. So it's, it is a comprehensive care which used to be given. But once, of course, ERTs have come, then the hospital-based um, HIV management has come has completely stopped because people could be managed from homes. Because if you are given, if you are on ART regularly, you don't have to fall ill, basically, except in the, some non-NCD like diabetes and cancer, etc. So that change has come. But basically, the message is you need to invest more in health, not just one program versus the other program, not versus NCD versus CD. I think that is a pointless debate, actually. Thank you so much. And as you say, perhaps it's because the overall resources dedicated to health yes. are so limited that everything within health becomes a zero-sum game. Absolutely. You push more on NCD, you have to cut from uh, communicable yeah. disease. Put yeah. more on AIDS, you have to cut from COVID. And ugly decisions and ugly trade-offs that ought never to have happened end up happening. All right. Uh, so I have a question from Mr. D.A. Prasanna for uh, Dr. Babu. Um, so... As you, in your first question to Ms. Gurnani, also mentioned how clearly many of the Western countries, which might have scored well on indices, did very poorly in actually managing this pandemic. And actually neighbors of India, which might be smaller than us, have also done an admirable job. So do you think, uh, say, how Bangladesh managed to manage the, the, the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, do you think there are lessons that India can draw from or... Are we a very different country of a very different scale where the lessons may not translate? That's a loaded question, Paul. So uh, I'll, I'll answer it uh, uh, from a different perspective. I must say gods have been kind to the South Asia region. If you look at the entire region in terms of the COVID-19 related uh, morbidity and mortality, uh, the region has done much uh, uh, better compared to most of the developed countries. We wrote a paper on this in the International Journal of Infectious Diseases, explaining what are the reasons, what are the similarities and what are the differences between these uh, nations in the South Asia. One of the reasons uh, probably is that, not probably, it is definitely is the younger age of uh, the entire South Asian region. Um, as a median, you would look at 25 to 29 across. So therefore, uh, they're born to do well with COVID-19. But one of the common uh, things across all these nations is poor pandemic preparedness. Uh, the country as a leader, of course, right now, India, because the leadership 
both at the national level and the state level has been exemplary one of the other things has been uh, in india has been using the technical groups uh, for managing the uh, pandemic uh, there are other uh, lacunas uh, in each uh, country i wouldn't go into the details of it but if we were to relay that okay this we did well so let's probably next pandemic also will similarly do if that's the kind of lesson that uh, countries are uh, probably getting which i don't think anybody is trying to generalize but uh, if we do not pay to a objective indicator then we are also at the loss of uh, um, you know of, uh, a greater calamities in the future so in order to change that both bangladesh and india will have to strengthen surveillance implement one health approach uh, to prevent uh, uh, future pandemics thank you so much uh, so if that question was a little loaded i'll have an even more loaded question for all of you and this comes from mr jagdish chinappa why if many of these challenges are of a national nature why is state why is health still a state subject uh, if data and services are expected to be uniform uh, uh, maybe we need to have a national health service so how do you then look at, look at the federal role of um, on health uh, when it comes to state versus the union well i think state state is i mean health is a state subject because the uh, taking care of the health of the people is essentially the responsibility of the state government and federal constitution i mean you have to change the constitution if you really want to take health out of the ambit of the state jurisdiction but that doesn't mean government of india has no responsibility in it is almost like a concurrent subject not like it, not as much as education but you find a lot of work uh, where government of india has to come in very strongly to provide support to the states uh, one is in uh, you know in disaster management for example because you have a national disaster management act whenever there is something like that the government of india has to come and uh, uh, stand for the support of the state governments second is national disease control programs where you have certain elimination targets which have gone and uh, uh, committed in new york in the un general assembly and the nation has a responsibility there so it is the responsibility of the government of india to see that the programs are implemented properly in the states and then report back so again something which government does so and then providing funds for the central sector projects for example hiv is a central sector project tb is a centrally sponsored scheme where 60% of the money comes from government of india and 40% has to be put to the state governments for example in the entire covid pandemic the entire purchase of vaccines and distribution is taken care of by the government of india so it is not that everything is done by the states and government of india doesn't do it is a nice mix of uh, responsibilities between the state and the center and each state need to be given that much of freedom resilience to perform better and not just be you know clad in a sort of straight jacket not put in a straight jacket if you have the willingness to perform better you should be allowed to for example the list of comorbidities for covid vaccination it is fixed by the government of india now you can't change that but there are states which would like to extend it for example to tb patients to hiv positive people to all sorts of diabetes people not just those few which are classified in government of india's list but they should have that freedom is so that where the state uh, comes in a state which has better initiative which wants to perform better should not be constrained from doing that so that's why it should remain a state subject but government of india's very strong support need to come in because ultimate responsibility ultimate accountability for performance lies with the government of india for protecting the health of the people if i may just add if uh, central assistance is taken off Uh, then most uh, states will suffer in terms of implementing some of the most important public health programs so this is irony right we say health is state subject and yet uh, most states completely depend on central assistance for running even the most important public health programs and even when they spend uh, money it is for either curative services or something like building hospitals uh never on uh, sustaining and uh, building the capacity of health workforce or in addressing determinants of health so that's the reason i said we need to change the orientation at every level
without changing them. When this becomes an election uh, uh, issue for people to debate and to understand why determinants of health is more important, I think then the states will also change. But right now, we are not there at. And I think uh, as uh, responsible citizens, uh, we should all involve in shaping the discourse towards uh, making everybody accountable for their own health and thereby uh, ensuring that this reflects at the state level also. Uh, thank you so much. And if may, if I may add something a little different to both of you, I think that many health challenges again need to be solved as locally as possible. Uh, you know, if you're th the most local you can go is the individual or the family unit, and we are talking about solving our health problems there. And I think it just scales up from that point. What can you solve within Bangalore that you don't need to uh, seek help from outside Bangalore. I think we need to think of that pretty much with all our uh, realms of governance, including health. But health obviously has large spillovers and externalities, right? In a in a highly connected and mobile world, it's not like you can ring fence any city, you can't ring fence uh, any state. I mean, we, we did that when the pandemic was was about to sort of uh, hit us and overwhelm us. But, but those are not things that one can easily do. So there are obviously spillovers. So there are roles for every level of government government, but let's try and solve as much of it uh, as much as we can locally. And again, I think it's a false dichotomy to say that we need a common set of standards and we need autonomy to states and cities to solve whatever they need to. You can have both. One doesn't mean that you take away from the other. States can innovate. So long as you set a benchmark, you set a minimum level of services, you know, you provide grants such that states which are fiscally handicapped or otherwise handicapped can, can um, meet those basic requirements. But beyond that, allow the states, allow the cities to do more. And, and I think that's, uh, I think that is the spirit of, I think, how the health has been a constitutional state subject, uh, but at the same time, the union government has played uh, various roles over the years. Uh, we have a couple of more questions and we have about 15 minutes. We are closing at 7.30. Uh, so uh, Tanya Jairaj asks, we speak about poor budgets for health, but how do we think about budget allocation versus uh, ability to spend allocated budgets? Uh, so in what way sometimes we want to fix the problem just by throwing money at it, but to even spend money properly, you need systems, right? So um, could uh, uh, perhaps uh, Mr. Rao, could you talk a little bit about how do you just build systems where one can spend? One can hire a doctor in every single taluk hospital and you can <laughs> fill all vacancies, spend the money that we are allocating. There is a third level also in between the budget uh, allocations and the utilization. That is actually releases. You know, it is not that the everything that is provided in the budget is released. You know, this is a myth. If you look at the budgetary system, there's something called a budget estimates and the revised estimates and an actual. So you'll find all the three differ very widely. Ultimately, you should look at the actuals. How much a government actually spent in a particular year? You know, that will be much less than what they have put in the budget or much less than what they've actually allocated to the to the implementing uh, agencies so most of the governments do this when you look at the budget oh so much has provided one lakh crores but actually you know even half of that is not given to the implementing agency that is a problem but coming to the question of utilization again it is a vicious circle because money is not provided you can't build the systems because you can't build the systems the utilization is bad so, and then money lapses at the end of the year. That is another big problem that, uh, you know, we have in our budgetary system. So, the message has to be, unless you build sustainable systems at the field level, their capacity to absorb funds and spend and utilize effectively will not be there. This is where we have been repeatedly failing. You know, for example, these primary health centers and the entire primary health care infrastructure, which we are carrying on for the last 60, 70 years, it is still in, the, in a moribund stage. Only now we have this so-called wellness centers coming up and then the Aishman Bharat coming up. But then 70% of the budget has to be spent at the primary healthcare level. That is what the health policy says. But look at how much is actually being spent. Much less. So unless you really see that particular proposal is actually converted into effective action at the field level, this problem will remain. You need to strengthen the infrastructure first. They increase the spending capacity 
of the implementing agencies, then the utilization will be there. Otherwise, just pushing money and saying that I have provided money and they're not utilizing it, it's, it's, it's no use. And uh, if I may ask a question, this is, uh, it's almost a saying now, and it goes that, you know, every large social sector mission mode scheme that, that we decide to introduce, ultimately its implementation and execution rests on the back uh, of an overburdened Anganwadi worker. Right. Yes. So yes. Uh, we've talked a little bit about community and the role of government, but could you, uh, and if uh, Dr. Chowdhury is here, uh, she can also add, how do we strengthen capacity at that level? With every Anganwadi worker, they're already overloaded. Uh, there are so many people who are doing uh, work at that last mile, and they already have a million things that, they, uh, that they're already loaded with. How do we change that uh, system? How, how do we I, actually create uh, strength over there at that level, rather than you know in Delhi or in Bangalore? I think two things need to happen. One is you need to have more people there. I mean, we have certain norms which we follow, which are age old, but I think you need to have more people, lesser number of units to, to, to look after, to see that, you know, more people actually are in the field to take care of that. Second is services should be provided at the lowest possible level. For example, the primary health center. If a doctor is not available, the nurse practitioner or, or a graduate nurse should be in a position to prescribe medicines so that the patient doesn't have to run to a subdivisional level hospital or a district level hospital for everything. In fact, in COVID itself, you'll find in how many COVID cases have actually been treated at the PHC level? Practically none. Everything came up to the secondary healthcare level. See, that is, that is really a very strange thing that happened in our country. Compared with Thailand, everything is done at the primary healthcare level. That means we are not strengthened that level. We have to provide more people, more equipment, you know, more services. That, that is the first thing. And if an Anganwadi worker is overburdened, you need five Anganwadi workers there, not one. Second thing is involvement of communities. That is again not there. Even now we have not been able to really think and invest in communities so that they can come and participate as equals along with the governmental system. That is, where, that is the biggest lacuna in our health system. And unless you address that, this overburdening of the public health system will continue. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Chaudhary, would you like to add to that? No, thanks. That's, that's perfectly fine. All right. Uh, we have another question, and perhaps we can wrap up to this question uh, from uh, Ms. Sujata Kelkashetti. Uh, perhaps I'll address this to Dr. Babu first. Uh, do you see an active effort to improve data collection systems across the country? Um, and do you see this, do you see the early signs of this happening beyond COVID-19 as well? Do I want to see? Yes. Do I see? I think I am seeing partially uh, because uh, there, there are many elements of this data collection and inference, right? So the first is to actually collect the data uh, from most uh, peripheral part of the country where people have to be trained there, they know what is the use of the data, and then the data gets used locally. So as you said earlier. Then the inferences based on this data, both at the local, state, and the national level. Now, uh, states that do well are generally the, the states which collect the data and use the data well. So therefore, there is heterogeneity uh, even in COVID-19 uh, response. Uh, always, the states that report well uh, generally get into trouble bef uh, before other states start reporting. So therefore, this has to change. This has to change towards uh, a narrative which says reporting is all right. Now, what do we do about uh, this burden of the disease? So I think it's a culture. Uh, we get used to it. Uh, we got used to this in uh, uh, HIV where we thought, we, I heard my advisor at uh, UCLA say when he came first to India and uh, one of the minister told him, HIV in India, you're joking. And this was much before the HIV program was started uh, in India. So uh, from that, we have come a long way in uh, generating the data and using the data. Now let's not uh, assume that the other problems are also not there just because the data doesn't exist. So I think transparency in collection, reporting, and uh, uh, inference is important.
thank you so much. Uh, I'd like to thank all our panelists to uh, for uh, for joining us today and uh, talking about uh, give you a few glimpses beyond whatever has been happening over the last year uh, about how our public health journey has been from uh, solving the AIDS uh, epidemic and tackling that to our current efforts in COVID nineteen. Um, uh, panelists, any remarks in closing from any of you? And uh, then we can wind up. Just watch out for the second epidemic in COVID. I mean, don't be complacent. Wear your masks, keep safe distances, and stay safe. Thank you. Absolutely. And, and let's remember that in the new normal, the important word is new and not normal. Normal doesn't mean we go back to a mask. The new normal I'd like to see is even after the entire population has been vaccinated, the moment we feel like we have a sneeze or a sore throat, we Wear put on mask. our mask before we leave the house. I think Absolutely. that's when I would say that as a community and society and as people who care for others who don't yet have an infection, we would have arrived. Uh, we've seen some of those changes happen in Southeast Asian countries over the last decade or so with SARS-1 and with SARS-2, uh, um, with SARS-CoV-2. I hope to see that kind of a change happen in India at the societal level and, of course, many changes at the government level. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, it was a pleasure to have this discussion. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you, Srinath. Thanks. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thanks.